as of now, this camp is closed. No one's supposed to be here, but you can see people are still coming by to pick stuff up. And tonight, the city says less than half of the people staying here are in shelters. Most folks just gathered their belongings and left. And Molly, tonight, there is still one tent here, but most of the camp is gone, leaving behind only some charred debris, needle caps, and bits of food. But tonight, some businesses like Amazon are staying silent, and at least one lawmaker is speaking out against the bill. We've been covering this violence outside the courthouse for months. It got so bad that a judge ordered this entrance to be shut down, and then the county passed more funding to put more patrol officers here on the street. And yet, the chaos continues. Tonight, the woman he robbed is in the hospital, and that gunman is still on the run after he grabbed that purse here on Northwest Market Street, fired a bullet into the ground, breaking those windows, and then took off in an SUV as police tried to catch him. As this memorial grows tonight, we've been seeing a lot more officers than usual on this block. The chief has said that'll be the case until further notice. Tonight, people are frustrated there hasn't been more widespread testing. Some people tell me they're feeling symptoms. Others are worried they may have the virus, not even realize, and then accidentally spread it. <coughs> Fahime Jamali is panicking. I'm worried if I have a coronavirus. She's with her husband and daughter. <coughs> and she's had a cough and fever for a week. And I'm just getting worse, worse, and worse. She went to a doctor last week. Daddy said, I'm not going to take a test from you. It's so expensive right now, and the hospital is not ready. For a couple days later, she called an ambulance. And they said, I have a coronavirus for sure. But you still haven't been tested. <coughs> no, they didn't take it. We've heard complaints of people with symptoms being denied a coronavirus test. Are enough people being tested here right now? No, no, I don't think they are. Dr. Scott Lindquist with State Health says Washington has plenty of test kits. The problem is doctors are running out of protective gear to collect the samples. The state desperately needs N95 masks, gowns, and gloves brought into the community. Is there any indication that we will get that PPE in anytime soon? Well, I think there is some indication that we'll get some, and I just don't think it's going to be enough fast enough. Some clinics are setting up drive through test stations, but most providers just can't take samples. So you need to find someone who can. And that's going to be the trick of calling around what urgent care, emergency room or large health system can do this. But you still need a doctor's note, correct, to get tested in this? Yeah, you, you really do need a provider saying, yep, this person needs to be tested. I would be persistent with my provider. I just hope one hospital take a test from me. Fahime is still asking for help for her and her family. I don't want everyone at home get sick, be dying here, and nobody care about us. This here is pretty much just what I got to take. This could be a big moment for Rico Sandoval. That's my next move. We go to shelter, go somewhere I could get off the street. City crews cleared Rico and three others from this staircase Tuesday as they hauled off the remains of this notorious encampment where police busted a drug ring last week. Once it's clean, they'll put up fencing to keep campers out. But well, what if they come back anyway? Then, then we'll warn and we'll move people off. The city has now cleared 28 people here. 11 of them went to shelters. And you've never been to a shelter? Um, no, actually, no, I haven't. Rico hopes this helps him turn his life around. I was thinking about um, um, probably even going back to school, man. You know, it's not too big of a deal, you know, homeless. Garrett, on the other hand, moved to this camp a block away. We're just waiting for him to be done with that, and they're probably going to go back. He's dealing with addiction and finds what he needs here. Do you worry about dying out here? I don't know, it's not something I'm afraid of. Like, it would almost be kind of nice to get it over with. You know, I want to either quit, you know, I want to quit. I want to be done with it, you know. I'm sick of drugs, you know. And there's Richard, who we met yesterday as he left the camp. I guess I'm going to go down the street and survive like I always have. Like, I'm not afraid. He slept in a parking lot, which he'll likely do again. I felt all right. I don't know. I, I, I'll just wait for myself to adjust, and then I'll make up my mind, you know. Then he walked off, leaving his sign, and found a spot to sit and get high before another night on the street. So you can wish me luck. Good luck. Thank you. Both of Teal's violent outbursts happen right here in courtroom 1201. It's a space several judges have told me is unsafe. 
And now Teal's case is heading to another courtroom as plans to renovate 1201 are moving forward. Compared to where I was living. Another hearing, another outburst. Mr. Corrado confirmed counsel. Christopher Teal, an accused rapist, taken down as he appears to step toward the judge. I will tell you! Just two weeks ago, Teal hit his now former lawyer in the face and security hauled him out. I'm an admitted pedophile! Both outbursts were in courtroom 1201. The judge again pushing back Teal's competency hearing. It's been suggested that we do so outside of 1201. Why would that make it safer? 1201 is a very confined, small courtroom with many, many people in it. Judges like Jim Rogers have voiced concerns about this felony courtroom for years. Attorneys and inmates pack into a small space as out of custody accused felons sit in a crowded gallery beside victims. It has to change. Now he says it may. There's an effort to uh, do some planning to remodel a 1201 space. The remodel plans are now with Executive Dow Constantine's office. They wouldn't offer any info. Judge Rogers will see the plans next week. What changes can people expect? We are hoping that there is an expansion of the space on 1201 in the space that currently exists where there's some walls that are taken out and the size is expanded. The construction cost is unclear, but relocating the courtroom might be too expensive because of transporting inmates. Right now, this bridge from the jail leads right to 1201. Judge Rogers hopes a renovation will prevent outbursts like these. They should be able to communicate with their lawyers, but not hit them. This is the one that I was wearing. Staring at his survival suit, Dean Gribble can't explain how he's still alive. Think about the other guys and how they're not here. Dean was the new deckhand on the Seattle-based crab boat, the Scandies Rose, recruited by his friend John Lawler for a four-month trip. We knew the weather was going to be bad, but again, that boat's a battleship. We go through the weather. But on New Year's Eve, their second night at sea, Dean and John awoke as the Scandies Rose was tipping. He yelled down, he goes, Dean, we're, get up, we're sinking. I go, what? So what do you have to do in a, a moment like that? Pray. It was frantic as the boat turned and the seven-man crew scrambled to escape in survival suits. So I started passing out the suits to everybody telling them to get them on. And I'm freaking out, the boat's going down, like it's going fast, it's fast. Dean and John stepped out into the frigid air. The boat was on its side. I'm screaming at these other guys. Get out of the boat. You have to get out of the boat. You gotta get out of the boat. The five of them never emerged. And I told John, we're not dying today. This isn't our time, John. We're not dying. Say it, John. We're not dying. Said it back to me, we're not dying. <laughs> Even though I, <laughs> in my mind, I knew we were dying. Then a massive wave took them into the icy water. They're the silhouette of the boat, standing straight up. Kind of, they're just rocking back and forth just slightly. And then it goes, just like the Titanic. And the scene went dark. As I'm floating there, just kind of <laughs> thinking about how I'm going to die. But as the boat sank, a pressurized raft came to the surface. Here's my mission. I'm going to get to that raft or I'm going to die trying. Dean reached it, then helped John get in. And they waited for four hours as their suits iced over until a light appeared. It was a Coast Guard helicopter. It was a very uh, beautiful moment. Those guys, uh, <laughs> I don't know how I can... Uh... <laughs> thank him enough. Dean is now recovering in western Washington with his fiance Mary. I'm just so happy. He painted this picture of the Scandies Rose sinking. Fishing to people, it's not a job. It's, 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 it's who I am. It's, it's a lifestyle. For now, he wants to honor the five men who never came home. I just wish there was more time. In Seattle, Gabe Cohen, Como News. At Shingletown Saloon in Ballard, bar manager Kristen Edwards is watching her back. It's just really sad. It's really messed up. She says this man, Patrick Kindness, is the reason why. Court documents show he has more than 100 convictions, and several Ballard business owners tell me he constantly roams the area, harassing people and bursting into businesses. Um, he'd come in, he'd stick his head in the door, flip us off, keep going. 
At one point, he was banging on the windows. One Just time. last month, Kristen says they called 911 to report him damaging one of these posts and were waiting for police when kindness oh approached God. her outside the bar. And at that point is when he pulled the knife out, flipped it open, and started approaching me with it. I was terrified. <laughs> I had no idea what was going to happen. Police arrested kindness. He was booked for felony harassment. It's at least his 10th time in the King County Jail this year. But just three days later, he was released. It was just eye-opening to me. It was like, how can that happen? Dan Murphy owns Shingletown and says his staff snapped this photo that night showing kindness back outside the bar. It's frustrating because I worry about uh, my staff. Are, are you happy for kindness? Yes. We ran into kindness on the street. They say you've been harassing some of the businesses here. Really, uh, I'm gone. I don't like this. He told us to leave him alone and denied pulling out that knife. I never did that. It hasn't stopped. He keeps coming back? Yeah. So what happened to the case? Well, Seattle police tell me they never referred it to the county prosecutor for a felony charge because detectives decided it didn't meet the criteria. Instead, they sent it to the city prosecutor, who's still reviewing it, but just as a misdemeanor. I would absolutely like to see this person locked up for a long amount of time. Kristen says um, she's now working with the prosecutor to press charges herself. Why do it? So this doesn't happen again. And yet the staff here worries it will without more accountability. And I don't believe they're going to do anything about those problematic people. And I think that's part of the problem is they feel emboldened. And I asked the city attorney's office why no charges have been filed for the incident here. They told me, well, they really can't comment on any individual cases. In the meantime, Shingletown Saloon has ramped up security, mostly to keep an eye on one guy. And Eric Shane McDaniel says uh, this feud dates back three years. You're going to hear the mayor's heated response to that in a moment. And all of this is over this huge pile of wood, about 160 cords of it that'll all soon be donated. Tonight, a heated feud keeps growing along with the wood pile fueling the flames. I'm not going to be bullied. Shane McDaniel was featured on Eric's Heroes last year for chopping all this firewood for charity, earning him the nickname Robin Wood. Now Shane's fired up after getting this notice from the city of Lake Stevens. I just couldn't believe it. These are the fines they say he could face for the wood piles outside his home and nearby store. The total? $35,000 for two weeks. It's just the bully mentality of the local government here. What's the biggest concern? Safety, public safety. Mayor John Spencer tells me it's a fire hazard, mostly for Shane's home, and neighbors are complaining, though the three I spoke with said they love Shane's work. We have talked to him many, many times to say, hey, you need to move that pile. But at this point, he's basically told us to blow off. I just thought, how can you find me for your wood. Shane says the city donated several logs a few months ago. The mayor denies that. You're saying the city never delivered wood no, to him? never. So where do we go from here? To court. The mayor says they have no plans to actually find Shane. You wanted to get his attention? Yeah. The whole goal here is to get the wood to people who need it. Let's get on with it. And if he needs help with it, we'll help him. Will you take that help? Uh, we have quite a few of our own volunteers. We don't need the government's dirty hands involved. They've done enough damage. Shane thinks there's a vendetta at City Hall over a reader board he put up at his store three years ago, claiming the city was misusing a building. They're still mad about that. It's bull****. There's no vendetta. What, what's the vendetta? I, he's a good guy. Neither side mincing words as the tension and the pile keep growing. I'm not going to let them piss on the whole parade on the eight-yard line. This is pretty damn silly. Outside the King County Courthouse, Kara Armitis is uneasy. I'm, I'm slightly uncomfortable, I won't lie. This was the last time she stepped out onto 3rd Avenue. That's Kara leaving work to catch a train. Surveillance video shows a man crossing the street mumbling to himself. He steps in front of Kara, she goes around him, and then he punches her in the back of the head, leaving her with a concussion. Although it was horrifying, it was not even remotely surprising. I've heard so many stories of people being attacked right here in this very spot. Courthouse employees and jurors are scared to go out onto 3rd Avenue because this is the scene. People drinking and abusing drugs, groups shouting, people in crisis or asleep in the nearby park, human feces and used condoms, and there's violence. This fistfight broke out just minutes after we got there. 
One of the men begged me to call 911. One took his shirt off and is now chasing him. So I did. They just crossed the street 30 seconds ago. We need help. Judge Sean O'Donnell came forward with these concerns nearly two years ago. Does it feel any safer? It's a hard one to say that the, the needles really moved much. Some argue conditions here are a bit better. The sidewalks now get washed each week. The city invested in this park next to the courthouse, and now the building opens the 4th Avenue entrance more often to keep staff and jurors safe. But Seattle police statistics pulled last month show more than 160 reported assaults near the courthouse so far this year. That's right on par with 2018. Members of the public deserve to feel safe when they come to their courthouse. Judge Jim Rogers says some jurors aren't even showing up out of fear. They're now posting these signs warning people to watch their surroundings and report any violence. The number of officers has increased on 3rd Avenue. We would like more. We think an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We spent hours on the block only seeing an occasional bike patrol despite frequent emergency calls. County employees have now been begging SPD for more patrols for close to two years. What would you ask of the city? I want them to come here and experience this. Kara sees an absurd contrast between the beacon of justice and resolution inside these walls and the problem no one can seem to fix right outside, forcing folks like her to watch their backs. It's almost like we're perpetuating this like rape culture where it's constantly don't do this, don't do that. But what about stopping their actions? I feel like that has not been done at all. In Seattle, Gabe Cohen, Como News. Earthquake. Earthquake. Experts Moderate say it's not if, but when the big one will hit. And when it does, a Cascadia earthquake shaking will damage cities. But it's the tsunami that could kill thousands. And the earthquake initiates. Karina Forsen with the Washington Geological Survey shows us a simulation of the tsunami hitting Washington's coast and flowing through Puget Sound. It could resemble the 2011 tsunami in Japan, destroying everything in its path. It's going to mean significant damage to infrastructure and a significant loss of life and some serious injuries. It's a very startling picture to paint. And the worst of it will be here on the coast, where waves up to 60 feet tall, moving like walls of concrete, could devastate these towns. That means that uh, you better know your evacuation routes and you better run as quickly as possible. Maximilian Dixon and State Emergency Management are creating new evacuation maps for several towns, showing how to walk to high ground given roads would be impassable. Practice walking them. But these maps reveal a horrifying reality. For many people, there won't be time. Just look at Long Beach, where it could take some people 60 or 70 minutes to get to safety. Problem is, the tsunami hits in less than 30. What's the reality for people who live in those areas? Well, people are going to die. That's the concern in Ocean Shores. Well, the neighborhood is pretty well gone if we have a really large tsunami. Mayor Crystal Dingler and her husband live near the center of this town of 6,500. It would certainly inundate us and, uh, you know, cover the living area of our house and up to the roof and maybe cover the roof. The science says that we would not have enough time to get out of town. A tsunami would destroy most of these homes. Unless it's a structure or infrastructure that's been specifically designed to withstand the forces of the tsunami and it's built high enough. How many buildings like that do we have on our coast? We have one. Acosta Elementary in Westport, the only vertical evacuation structure in North America. This is an evacuation drill with their students. If the big one hits, people in Westport will have a walkable shelter. Now, the state wants to build more vertical evacuation structures across the coast. They're studying how many they need. It's likely dozens. Yeah, we want to be able to do the best we can to save as many lives as possible. What's the timeline? Decades. It's going to cost tens and tens of millions of dollars. But for now, this, this is what there is. Mayor Dingler hopes to break ground on a $5 million structure in Ocean Shores next year. But they're waiting to hear if FEMA approves $3.6 million in funding. It's not a want, it's a need. Given the grim reality on the horizon. It's really an opportunity for people to save themselves and perhaps save their neighbors. On Washington's coast, Gabe Cohen, Como News.